Gold Shields brings true stories from law enforcement, the military, true crime authors, and first responders. Experience the dedication, danger, and emotional toll with the heroes themselves. These gripping tales of true crimes, true stories, and true heroes are all here on Gold Shields. Welcome back to Gold Shields, the first episode of Season 2. I'm Dan Murphy, along with my partner in crime, Tom Smith. Every week, we bring you the most compelling stories from law enforcement, from those who support it, and from those who chronicle the great work and interesting cases that are done. Today, we have a guest that is absolutely off the charts. We are so excited about it. We have leaked it in our previews, but I'm going to let Tom introduce her. Uh, Before that, we want to tell you about some of our friends that are out there. First of all, you may notice me on the show. I'm always drinking bone frog coffee. Why? Because I need a boost? No, because I love the flavor. Bone frog coffee is unbelievable. Tim Crookshank, retired Navy SEAL, has a mission in life now. His mission is to not just bring great coffee, but to give back to the SEAL community. And he does that via bone frog. Bonefrog.com slash gold shields get a discount on their already affordable, incredible coffee that they source from South and Central America. Bone frog coffee. Tom, what else do you want to talk about today? Welcome back. Welcome to 2024, brother. Yeah, season two. Who would have thunk it, you know, last year, this time, us trying to figure right, out what the hell we were going to do. Yeah. Uh, and we said this, and, and we said this on our, our, our live Instagram show. We had seven shows lined up, and then we had no idea what we were going to do after that. And then here we are on our 52nd show and season Unbelievable. two. I mean, we're blessed. We're happy. We're thrilled. Uh, just getting back to Bonefrog real quick. I, had a, I talked to Timmy last night, and they had a great holiday season with the push that, that we helped out with, uh, with their, their boxes and their gift cards and, and everything. So the holiday was great, and we're so fortunate to have a, a company like Bonefrog Coffee in our corner uh, sponsoring us and supporting us. Well, I don't know if we could come up with somebody better to start season two. And you know what, Dan? I was sitting around. And I'm like, all right, how do we introduce this legend? How do you introduce a legend? How do you do that? And I'm like, you know what? It's Aphrodite Jones. (laughs) That's it. It's just, it's Aphrodite Jones, who everyone knows and everyone coming into this knows. And, you know, 25 years of doing this, investigative reporter, best-selling, award-winning author of, it would take two hours to name everything she's done. But we are just honored beyond words to start season two off with such a great woman in the world of true crime, Aphrodite Hello. Jones. AJ, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you for that <laughs> uh, legendary intro. I don't know if I deserve that. No, you but do. Okay, I'll take it. Your name is synonymous just take with this it. whole genre, and you are not somebody who takes um, something you're looking into on face value. You are somebody who digs. You're somebody who asks the right questions, who gets the right information, and we respect that immensely as former detectives. And you're somebody who we are so privileged to be talking to today. Uh, And the stuff you work on is fascinating. So we can't wait to dive into that stuff. Well, I have to tell you guys, by the way, I'm very very proud to be on your show. Um, I love what you're doing. And, you know, I think the police continue to get this bizarre rap out there by the woke. And I'm sorry, but I am just absolutely outraged by it. Um, I, as I'm sure anybody, in this, I know all my friends in law enforcement are. But the question is, are people going to start resigning? I know that some people have started resigning early, that there's early retirement, da da da. I mean, we're really destroying, um, at, we're creating more chaos in our society because of this. And Anything I could do to support law enforcement, man, I'm there. And that's great. And that's what that's what we need, you know, and, and that was the basis of, of Dan and I doing the show. You know, we've talked about it all last year. We'll talk about it this year. The what was going on with the view of law enforcement in the country had to change. And if we could do a show highlighting the work that no one knows about, no one hears about, no one sees, that's what we're going to do. And the incredible work that's out there. That needs to get out there even more. And we, when we have people like you in our corner supporting it, it gets better, you know. And 
I don't think this is going to last forever. I think it's going to go back to to a respect level. I'm hoping uh, it has to. It, it has, has to. to. I agree because There's no it's two un- ways to it's unsustainable. And and at some point, everyone wakes up and goes, "Oh yeah, we need the police." <laughs> Well, the mayor of Philadelphia, I think the other day, made an announcement. She wants law and order. Yeah. She must please. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How did you ever get rid of yeah. police? What, you know, what were you Tom and I are both right. uh, kids of the city from New York City. We both grew up in New York City. And I remember being a kid in the late 60s and the 70s and then becoming a police officer in the 80s and seeing what New York City had disintegrated into. And it was literally out of control. And watching it come back. And now watching it, I don't live there anymore, but watching it sort of from afar, go down that slippery slope again. It all has to do with leadership. It all has to do with attitude. And it has to do with perception. And if you're perceived, uh-huh. And you think with, with having a mayor who was former law enforcement, that things would have changed drastically. That's what we thought, because I'm, I'm in New York. And uh, that hasn't been the case. No. No, we hope not at all. And you hope and you keep your fingers crossed that it that it changes, you know, and then we get a sense of order again and people can go back on the street and start running through Central Park again and walking through Times Square because it is. Listen, I've had the fortune of traveling around the world and there is still no place like New York. There's not. No, no, there's no place like New York. And I have to say, just before we get into the my crime life, my life of crime. <laughs> okay. Is that uh, I also lived through uh, New York, uh, Son of Sam. I grew up with that. I uh, lived through Manhattan when I was a kid. Um, Broadway was peep shows and hookers and scary. And, um, you know, I lived in Manhattan and I, you know, was being whistled at by construction workers. I know people were getting raped. And, you know, just all of the horrors of New York City. And then that was 70s and 80s. And then things, Giuliani, you know, came and cleaned it up. Um, really change the face of New York. And and one thing I will say, even though there's all this, you know, looting and crime, et cetera, um, in other cities, I don't see it as much in Manhattan anymore, right. honestly. And also, I do go in and I've taken the kids to Times Square and it's been fine. And, you know, with the holidays, I was there. Um, it's not like it's made out to be necessarily in the news. That's all I'm saying. There's a there's an overemphasis on the negative. And of course, the yeah, news I, I would agree. I and mean, you know, Tom and I still know plenty of people who are still in the NYPD um, at various levels within the department. And there's still great people there. And they are really trying to deal with um, a tidal wave of negative perception, uh, defunding issues, uh, having to get creative and, and do things in different ways. And they are. And it's in good hands. And we feel good about that because we know that there's great people there, and it and when the city's leadership decides to do certain things, the department's ready. And uh, individually, one on one, there's still people I respect immensely, and always will. Oh, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. So let's get into Aphrodite Jones. You know, y- you have, you know, you have shows, but we want to get like how, why, how did yeah. you become what you became, and why. Like, what was the draw with, with what you delved into? Okay, so a couple of things. First and foremost, I was a writer. I'm a writer. And I was a journalist prior to writing books. And what I was doing was chronicling the evolution of cable television. I didn't have any idea I was going to be involved in crime. That was the last thing I thought in the world. And um, you know, I wanted to be a movie star out in Hollywood, and that's where I was. And it was all great. And the Disney Channel launched, and the Playboy Channel launched, and I was there for all of it and MTV, and you name it. But anyway, uh, I wound up in Appalachia as a professor. I did a PhD program at NYU. I was completing the dissertation. And I went to Appalachia to uh, teach full-time. And whilst there, I was also doing radio broadcasting because, again, I've always wanted to be in that field, whether it's television, broadcasting, radio, whatever. And uh, while I was reporting on the radio, an FBI agent killed his lover, informant lover. And she was a hillbilly mountain woman and nobody paid attention to it. And I'm like, where's the news? Like, where's CNN? What's going on here? This is 1989. What's happening here? How can this not be in the news? This is the only FBI agent in the history of the FBI before and since 
that has ever pled guilty to murder copying a manslaughter plea. His name is Mark Putnam. So when it happened, I had already written a book about Hollywood, which was out with agents in Manhattan. And so I contacted one of the agents. I said, you know, what about this? What about this story? Where? And he said, well, you know, a rule will probably do it. You know, I said, I not say a rule. I, I was so far away from crime at that point. I had finished the PhD program at NYU. Anything like true crime was considered trash by the elitists over there in the ivory tower of NYU. Um, and so, I, okay, true book of what? Let me read it in cold blood. I read it. Who knows what you don't know when you don't know it in my 20s that and I could do this. I wrote a proposal. It got sold. I wrote the book. Um, it became a TV movie with Patricia Arquette playing the uh, victim, Susan Daniel Smith. Uh, Stephen Weber played the, the FBI agent. Um, it ran for years. It was a MLW, a movie of the week at the time on ABC. Then went to Lifetime. As that was happening, my next book project came along, and that was the book that became Cruel Sacrifice. And that's a story about four teenage girls who murdered a 12-year-old girl in a lesbian love ring, which is completely insane. Um, you, you can't touch that book without being absolutely shaken to your core, especially the first part of it. It's so drastic and just unthinkable. That book became New York Times bestseller. I then sent you bye to NYU in their dissertation. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> I don't need you anymore. I don't want, I really don't want to be Dr. Jones. I'll just be me. And uh, yeah. So uh, once that happened, though, um, I was stuck with the genre of true crime. I kind of wanted to get out of it because that story just shook me to my core writing it. And I want to get out of it. And the publishing world was not having it. So I wound up in getting contacted by the friends of Tina Brandon, who became Brandon Tina, which was the first transgender murder chronicled in America, which I wrote the book on called All She Wanted, now called All He Wanted. There was no such word as transgender, guys, at that time in 1993 when that happened. It didn't exist, not in this country. I've looked it up. It did exist in Europe here and there, but I saw somebody with a t-shirt on and said, transgender menace. I was interviewing the person. I said, what's transgender? I mean, I knew transgendered. And that's how this person who it goes from male to female, back to male to female um, throughout the story, um, was I described as transgendered because that's all there was. Um, interestingly enough, the transgender community can't stand me because I gave a speech at their one of their early um rallies about who they are and how transgender people need to be recognized and no one can have boy or girl on their on their licenses and passports and no sh nobody should wear pink or blue and i was not thrilled with the mentality thinking that basically it's all about them and everybody else doesn't count and so i went into this was a triple homicide that i was covering i was covering it in court and the reason that brandon tina really tina brandon legally was killed was because they raped her. These two guys raped her as a her. And she went to the police and the sheriff and reported it. So she he became she again, all right, because she wanted to report that crime. And they said, if you report it, we're going to kill you, which they did. But they also killed two other innocent people in the process. It was a triple homicide. So I made the mistake of saying this wasn't just about Tina Brandon, Brandon Tina. This was about a triple homicide that they were prosecuted for. Well, they basically took the hook and pulled me off the stage. If they had tomatoes, they would have thrown them at me. And since that time, guys, I have never been acknowledged for having written the book that is the only book about a transgender murder that started this whole thing, movement, in America. Wow. It is. And Hilary Swank plays that character in the Hollywood film about it. And I've... Exactly. And it was, my book was the basis for that, for that film, on um, Boys Don't Cry. However, I had to sue the studio because they took it out from under me, even though I had the life rights to the main characters, et cetera, et cetera. And they settled with me. So, And they settled with Diane Keaton, who was producing the film, and Richard Barrymore, who was set, slated to star in the film. So it was a whole thing in the backdrop there. And uh, I just wonder, you know, why it is still to this day, all these 30 years later, whatever it is, yeah, 30 years, why it is that. You know, I just never have had any acknowledgement. I know they didn't like me. I know they didn't like that I said it's about more than one person. No, it was only about their cause. Okay, but what about when it wrote? What about the, the movie Boys Don't Cry that presents 
branded Tina as lesbianish. Yeah. They didn't get it right either back then. You know, so I don't know. Strange world, strange times. Well, you're certainly ahead of your time, that's for sure. Uh, but it's amazing when, you know, you, you, you dive into something and you had, this doesn't happen, AJ. You know, when, when people write books and, and so on and so forth, the immediate success isn't the normal route. You the know, immediate you success hit it that you and saw just is hit it uncommon. Right um, and just led to one after another after another. Well, you know, all I can say is I am a perfectionist with my craft. I am absolutely determined. I am, uh, you know, relentless with what I do. I mean, I just finished a book, came out la late last year called Levi's Eyes. I spent four years documenting the most heinous crime uh, committed by a man. He killed his first wife in a fire and killed his biological son by dropping a three-ton barn truck on his son, crushing him and leading him there um, to die. He almost got away with all of it. And the funny thing about that story is, his name is Carl Carlson, still writes to me. Uh, I don't haven't answered him in two years. I don't know. But uh, that if people, we've done this story, did it on my show, 2020's done it, I did it on that show with it, Dateline's done, all these shows have done that particular story. And yet, my book is selling like crazy. And why? Because I have more. There is more. And in that case, I had something that I've never had before. And that was unfettered access to the killer. So I spoke to this man, Carl Carson, from his jail cell, the OAZ awaited trial. Now, what have, do you know of any uh, person that's awaiting a murder trial that would talk to media or, a, or an author prior to the Nobody trial? Nobody's got a lawyer. No. Who, who knows how to talk to them? Yeah. Exactly. Anybody who's smart. So, right. It, so he's crazy, man. He's talking to me before the trial, during the trial, after the trial, and when COVID hit, he never got shipped back to New York where he had to serve his initial sentence for killing his son that he pled guilty to. So he was out in California, found guilty first degree murder out there, and was stuck in that jail in Calaveras County for another nine months. So I had an extra year talking to this man five days a week on tape. And the stuff coming out of his mouth is, is not to be believed. And that is why. A lot of people who read that book say to me, I had to keep looking back to make sure this was wow. actually a real story. Can't believe it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm fortunate. Fortunate. But again, the amount of effort I put into that, two years of transcriptions of all my conversations with him, mixing that in with 3,000 pages of documents, court transcripts, police reports, all of it, this is what I do. And to then weave it into a story that seems like a novel, it, it's it's time consuming. It's 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 a whole thing. It's very I don't know how to explain it. I be I be I go into a zone that I I, I really can't even recognize myself. Honestly, yeah, you know, I'm a different person when I'm writing. I, I time ends. I don't know what they, pe people think. I'm very flighty, and I am because I'm living in my books. All I'm you know, writing. I'm walking around, I don't know, which way am I headed? Okay, whatever, here, let's turn over <laughs> you here. You have no idea how so much you have in crazy. common with the gentleman on the other screen. Uh, when, it when it comes to working a case, Is that I right? never saw anybody so laser-like focused on the outcome or getting the bad guy or getting the evidence or a combination of the above. Never saw anybody so like, hey, Tom, it's, it's midnight. Uh, you might want to eat something. That, you know, that's... That's definitely something we have in common. And I have to say, the, you know, the most successful people in this world are the ones who are laser focused. And, I, you know, I tell kids all the time these days, you know, why are you trying to listen to songs while you're doing homework, while you've got earbuds and you're online and you're, you know, you're watching your phone, you're not watching the movie. What are you doing? You can't ingest all of that information at once. It's all diluted, and then you've got a basically a hodgepodge. That is so of really well said nothing. and so true. Human beings, as much as we think we can multitask, what happens is we end up giving very small periods of time to different things, and we we think we did it all at the same time. We didn't. 
our brain doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say just one last thing about Levi's eyes and that's important in terms of investigators and, and their and the, the uh, dedication to the, the field and to what they do. The fire chief fire investigator of the house that burned down in Murphy's, California in 1991 on New Year's Day. He was investigating this and they didn't have enough money in that small county there to let him go to New York. The, the killer, Carl Carlson, had flown already back to New York with his kids that he saved out in the fire. So he comes back a hero. I saved my kids. I couldn't save my wife. He starts a whole new life with a new wife, etc. And because they didn't, they didn't do any, pursue the case any further, you know, they closed the case. It was just, that's it. It was an accidental fire paid out, insurance payout. Um, the fire investigator, um, Carl Kinn, when he retired, he held on to all those records for years. And when he retired, he knew that at some point that Cal Fire would destroy records because after seven or 10 years, they do that. And so he took them all home with him. And wouldn't you know, the day came and I watched him at trial say, and he said, why'd you keep those bodies? They said, well, I just thought there might be a day. Objection, objection. Yeah, he knew he had it and he had tapes videotapes, audio tapes, all of it. And that's how this killer got caught. That is and awesome. Because of one man's determination. You know, if you're you know? going to do this job well, uh, Tom and I know this and anybody knows it, and I'm sure you know it, you have got to be dedicated and committed to a point of years later, you still remember the names and details of your cases. In Oculus cases, people think, oh, who cares yes. about that? Well, it was my case. And when it was my case, it meant everything to yeah, me and I yeah. was focused on it. And years later, Tom and I can talk and we'll be like, hey, remember this one? Yeah, this was this. This guy did that. It was that time. Never forget it because it means that much to you. You're still committed to it. And thank God for that, for that one specific fire investigator's determination and uh, just dogged desire to keep going, not quitting. I love it. Right. Not letting it go. He wasn't going to let that go. And by the way, oh, they yeah. did destroy the records because they moved to another facility. So he was right. And chain of command was kept in place because he put him in a locker in the basement awesome. of his house and never looked at him again. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So you've got so much stuff you've worked on. We talked a little bit before the episode today, didn't we, Tom? What what uh, what did we kind of decide or what we kind of decide with Aphrodite? That was something that we really wanted to talk about as one specific case, but with a last name yeah. that seems to be synonymous with being a dirtbag. Um, <laughs> and I hate to say that yeah. to anybody who carries I mean, that name, but yeah, it's just... we, we, but it's bizarre. It's just weird. You know, three of the, the most prominent killers, you know, in the last 20, you know, years. 20, 30 years are Peterson. Like three of the most known cases, cases yep. out there, Talking. and it's mm -hmm. weird because when you when you yeah because when you say one, you have to kind of go through your right. rolodex of which one you the get Peterson talk about. case. Which one is that? You know, so yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but I think we we came up with one, and I, I had asked AJ when we spoke, which is there a case out there that still even to this day kind of gives you a chill, kind of like you know what that one. Sticks, he froze on me. Yep, sticks a little bit, and and we did come up with one. And uh, Aphrodite, I'm gonna leave it to you. Let's let's get into this this uh, Michael Peterson case and and the staircase, and we'll get into the owl. Oh yeah, that's for damn sure. <laughs> uh, but let's 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 dive into this fascinating case. So you know the staircase on Netflix has become one of the biggest uh, true crime series. It actually was the first long-form series uh, made by a documentarian. And so it, it was actually shown at film festivals initially many years ago when it was done in 2004. And then it was updated in 2010 or 12. And then again, in 2018, it came out on Netflix. And it's 13 hours. Um, I wrote a book about that trial, Michael Peterson trial in Durham, North Carolina. His wife fell down the stairs of their mansion and he found her. And at that trial, I felt certain that he would get convicted, but I could see that nobody was quite sure about it, not even the judge. 
it became apparent to me everybody was on pins and needles. Um, it's interesting that he got convicted of first degree murder of his wife by a jury. I was there. And then after serving time in prison for eight years plus, because of a technicality, because the blood expert of the state had misrepresented his CV and had misrepresented some of his testimony, and more importantly, they declared a mistrial. He's let out on an ankle bracelet, spends a couple of years on an ankle bracelet, is recording more of his TV show, which winds up on Netflix, with his whole team right there behind him and his kids behind him, everything wonderful Michael Peterson, for Michael Peterson, the victim of a tragic American justice system. This is what we portray in The Staircase. Uh, no. If you read my book, A Perfect Husband, Mr. Perfect Michael Peterson, who had the perfect marriage, also had somebody else that fell down the stairs in his life. 16 years prior in the 1980s in Germany. I guess who's the only person Michael who found Michael Peterson. Her? Michael. Johnny on the spot. That's He's such a it. good husband. He's always there. Well, that wasn't oh, okay. a husband. That was a friend. It was interesting. A friend. Quote. Um, she, had, she had put in her will that she wanted Michael and his then wife, his first wife, to be the guardians of her two girls. Should anything happen to her, or something happened to her, he collected the girls. And those two girls, Margaret and Martha Ratliff, are key, key figures in the documentary who absolutely believe in their father's innocence. And it is their belief that then lends itself to the belief throughout that Michael Peterson couldn't have done this, that he's innocent. And if you continue to watch the Netflix, doc Netflix documentary, you will see that it seems like you're getting everything in real time. It seems like you're seeing all of it. Oh, it turns out he's bisexual. Who knew this? Oh, it turns out somebody else was down in a staircase in Germany. Oh, this. Oh, that. But in essence, that filmmaker who's had the goal of making the American justice system bad, okay, that was his goal. And he accomplished it by telling just enough, but not putting in the most essential evidence, not putting in things that would condemn this man beyond belief. And so you have this thing where we don't, where it's a who done it. You see New York Times reviews of this thing. Who did it? And I want to emphasize the word who. <laughs> who? <laughs> good. How does that good how does that roll in? Good we all know, but let's let's tell the audience what, what that reference is to. Um Well, you guys go ahead. You mentioned it already. Well, you know what? Before that, I just want just one quick thing. You know, when when you walk the, watch a documentary and you and you see the kind of the, the video of the crime scene where we as detectives have a way to look at things. You know, when you when you enter, there's certain things that jump out. There's certain things you look at. And two major things popped out when I watched the uh, the documentary and saw the video, a the blood, the amount of blood that was there. I fell down the stairs before my wife's fell down the stairs before. And you go, ow, and you get up. You know, it, it, right. that's just kind of what it is. Uh, the the point of the how dry the blood was is troubling because that doesn't dry instantly. That takes a while. Right. That takes a while to happen. But one thing in particular that jumped out, and, and this is just, you know, Dan, you know, we talked about it, and AJ, we actually had a, a brief conversation about it also. When you hear the 911 call, and he goes through his script, and that's what I really believe it is. Heavy breathing, the, the panic, all this. Because he has a certain script in mind, the first question the 911 operator asks him sends him into a tizzy. You know, he's expecting, is she breathing? Is she this? Which he has all the answers to. And then the 911 operator throws in the question, how many stairs did you fall down? And you hear the difference in his voice go, but what? Because he's not ready for that. That's not part of the script. He's standing there, apparently, you know, if you, if you believe him, he's standing over her body. 
when he makes the call because he's talking about her either breathing or not breathing. All he's got to do is look up and tell you how many stairs there are. And he doesn't answer that question. And he does later. He does later. Oh, 15, 20 or something like that. But that really jumped out at me. It does jump out. And what the other thing that jumps out is, if you get into the real details, he hung up on the emergency operator. He hung up on the dispatcher and then called back. So he got thrown off. So he hung the phone up. Now, the second time he makes the call, he um, all of a sudden she went from she's breathing to she's not breathing. Well, which is it? So if she was breathing, uh, you're there. She just now stopped breathing. So he's got a different script that he's going with now on the second call. And um, just, you know, the way he set that up is so similar to what happened in Germany. And he got away with it in Germany. And he really thought he was going to get away with that in Durham, North Carolina. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, people who do stuff like this uh, who are not career criminals, but this guy obviously has a streak in him of whether it be narcissism, sociopathology, something is going on with him. He's not, a, he's not an accomplished person at it in terms of a whole lifestyle of doing it. So he's going to screw up. He's going to make mistakes under pressure. And even if he wanted her dead, as long as he could remember, he's still going to be excited and agitated at that moment. And he's not going to be thinking clearly. He's going to be like Tom said, here's my script. I'm sticking to it. And as soon as you can knock him off that, and we took advantage of that as investigators, you sit down with somebody, I know this person is holding on to their story, but I also know right behind that veneer is a person who I can manipulate to get them to break down to mess with their nerves, to work on it. And there's a whole psychology behind it. But this individual, when I watched him on that series, walking around the house and guiding them through, we were out here having wine, and then she went in. There's a way people talk as though they are creating the scenario or trying to remember the lie they told. Uh, and one of those things is the first time you interview somebody who was involved in something, it's in the past, obviously. I'm interviewing you now. Why are you speaking present tense about it? And yeah. Interesting. That's an interesting So they go insight. to present tense because yeah. they're making it up on the fly. But he had already told a story. So as he's doing it, he's being very careful to make sure that whatever my final story was to the police, I have to make sure on camera here. So that takes some thought. <laughs> he's going from room. He's compartmentalized my story in this room, my story in this room. And to me... As I'm watching it, forget about whatever bias I may have towards him. Just watching him, I see a man on edge and not over the loss of his wife, but over, I have to keep this straight. Yeah. Although you have to, you have to, if you watch the entirety of the, of the series, which is quite long, it's 13 episodes, you will see that he gets very comfortable with his pipe and his smoking and his legal team that's all too arrogant. Um, one of whom, David Rudolph, uh, his mentor was Barry Sheck of O.J. Simpson fame, um, who was helping Rudolph throughout the trial um, in the backdrop. I'm aware of that. Um, so that he he's, in his mind, he's got the number one team. He's got everything in his corner. And he's going to get out of this. And he did not do it. He did not do it. He bound her, you know. And there's no evidence. It was that pesky there's bird. There's no evidence. <laughs> it was that. Yeah. <laughs> bird of prey. Bird of prey. Uh, you bizarre. Know, uh, bizarre. The other thing um, that I, the other thing I got out of the 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 show was how quick his emotions change. You know, he he the camera would go on and he'd play the oh, oh wiping it, and then in five seconds he's laughing about something it it's just it's a bizarre show to really you know especially when you do what we do and you and you're used to talking to people and watching people and how they act and stuff and you you watch this and it's 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 creepy and it yeah well and if you and if you happen to read the book you will see a very different portrayal of this person on um, going back to his days as a marine under the Vietnam war and and what all he was involved with there, writing these czar novels that are all about 
uh, you know, gay sex and twisted military action and just weirdness. And of course, he was bisexual and he was having uh, dates with escorts, some of whom were military uh, young men. Um, he had a whole fascination with this. He wrote about it in his quote novels. And um, they were novels. I mean, he did okay with them. He never made the money he wanted to make. He thought it was going to be Tom Clancy. That didn't work out for him. But uh, his bisexuality is something that his team played on by saying, in essence, these prosecutors, this whole prosecutorial team, including Dwayne Deaver, who later winds up being the expert who kind of muddied the waters with the blood evidence, um, that he, he really believed that and, and sold the idea that, hey, not only didn't I do this, but we have every reason to prove we, I will prove my innocence. I will prove it. And it, one of the things they did is hit on the prosecutors and say, you are homophobic. And you see it in the Netflix series, and you see, I talk about it in the book, the only reason you're after him is because you're homophobes. And he told me, I interviewed him in prison, by the way, Michael Pierce. He told me his wife knew about his bisexuality. She was all fine with it. Um, and that because the, the people in the Bible Belt in Southern Durham, North Carolina, couldn't tolerate gayness or bisexuality, this is why they went after him. That was one. And the other was, he had written a column for a number of years at the Durham paper. And as a columnist, he attacked the police for various things that they did or did not do with drug violence, gang violence, whatever. And he believed and sold to his minions that, uh, you know, the police were after him because he had attacked them publicly. So this was all he was being framed. Unbelievable. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there who've watched this and believe you it. say a lie enough you say it with enough confidence repeat it enough people will filter it through their own biases and decide whether they want to believe it or not and when you hang yourself when you put the victim um label on yourself like he did and you align yourself with a certain group you win a percentage of the population but you know the other interesting thing about him as creepy as you you say he is you have the you have the the benefit of 2020, right? Vision. Uh, uh, the the fact is, back in time, he's charismatic, and one of the people that he had convinced in terms of his minions was a, a state senator by the name last name of Galifianakis, and I'll never forget because he's Greek, and I interviewed him, Nick Galifianakis. He's God passed, he rests his soul. Nice, lovely man, and he's the one who got me the interview with Michael Peterson in prison after he was. In there, lost all his appeals. It was over. Bum. Um, and the funny thing, Nick Galifianakis, who believed 100% that Michael Peterson was absolutely innocent, framed, and this is a, a person of government, he says to me at one point, you know, I have a nephew who's <laughs> going to be a movie star. He's out in Hollywood, of course. That Galifianakis. I oh, mean, that is funny. You can't write that this stuff, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. So, so what I'm saying to you is Michael sold his story to a lot of people. It wasn't just his kids or his first wife, who, by the way, flew in from Germany and sat there every day in the trial supporting her husband. That was her ex-husband that cheated on her and left her, all of this. So, you know, he, he cares about it. Very you know, true. It, in real life. Not so much when you're watching that the documentary. You know, you, you get this, you, you're right, it's an eerie feeling about him. Eerie is a nice yeah. word for a creepy, you know, weird. There, there's, there's other words, but we try to be, you know, <laughs> PG on this show as much as possible. But, um, <laughs> yeah, a fascinating case. I, I haven't seen the entire, I've probably seen three or four episodes so far, and I have read a little bit of your book. I just got it the other day. Uh, and usually I'm a voracious reader. Tom knows that. But we have so many guests who have books. And my problem is I don't read five pages of a book. I read the whole thing. Um, and, I, and I generally read three at a time. I hear you. So uh, <laughs> I always have two or three. Wow. Just, you know, I love to read and I love true stories. And I don't, I don't have time for, uh, for fiction for some reason. That it's true. Well, hopefully you'll like mine and you'll get a chance to read it because uh, 
it's definitely one of my better ones. And, well, I'm sure, and people I'm, love I'm that sure I will enjoy it. And I'm looking forward to reading it. I'll probably start this evening. Um, so Michael Peterson case, he has been convicted. He's ultimately uh, found guilty after not a small amount of effort on, on behalf of the state. And a great full court press from his attorneys. And that seems to be something we see commonly in high profile cases is these very high profile, big money attorneys coming to the defense and influencing uh, juries, influencing courtrooms, influencing the media, influencing public opinion. And they and they have press conferences outside the courthouse every day. How much have the, of that have, have you seen? really sway in your personal experiences, really sway juries and really sway communities? Um, because it seems to me it's very powerful. I think it is powerful. And uh, in this case, uh, they did have somebody, they had a star, Dr. Henry Lee, who testified for the defense, that who, who got up there and did the whole show about spitting ketchup onto a white placard which he had done at the O.J. Simpson trial. And he testified that there was, quote, too much blood for it to not have been from a fall. I, I don't know how Henry Lee came up with that, but he actually said it. And I'm in the courtroom going, well, what are you talking about? People were believing him. People were asking for his autographs in, in, in the uh, elevator. Okay, not, obviously not the jury. But you could see that he was pulling people over to his side. But then what happened? Something interesting. The defense got so cocksure of themselves that they decided we are going to take the jury on a little field trip to the mansion, the Peterson mansion. And we're going to go there and we're going to show them the staircase so they can see the amount of blood and how this happened. Well, that was the end of it. I interviewed jurors after the fact for my TV show, right? And uh, they said, when we saw that staircase with all that blood, there's no question in her mind that he killed her. So, but here you have, in it, he got twisted around because that dream team that he had, including Henry Lee, that part. So the jury found him guilty. They truly found him guilty, life without parole. And then, of course, we have Dwayne Teeter, the blood expert on the state side, who had not only fortified his resume, but had done certain experiments that weren't kosher with the blood stain analysis and the stairway, et cetera. And, and uh, he winds up because in a prior case, he had testified in a murder case. Somebody was um, convicted and set, spent uh, 14 years in prison, 17 years in prison for a crime that the only thing that linked him to a murder, a woman who was beaten to death, the only thing that linked this person to that murder was one spot of blood in the car. Well, Deaver got on the stand and said that that was human blood. Later, it turned out that the notes he wrote detailed that it was actually not human blood. And because of that, now comes David Rudolph. We need a new trial. This guy falsely testified. All this science is junk science. And this is why, strangely, and, and what we're dealing with now is a huge amount of people around the world who have seen not only the movie, not only the documentary, but also watched David Rudolph go all around the country with his and the world, presenting how crooked the American justice system is, presenting the theory about this owl, that they are believing. They are believing that the American justice system was corruptly uh, going after this man, Michael Peterson. And that he had his, he's innocent. I, I don't know. I don't know how, how do you, how does that happen? You know what? In today's, what, what's going on today? I'm sorry, Dan, cut you off. Uh, you know, the, the, the kind of, like you mentioned at the beginning of the show, the woke atmosphere, they need like one crack in an arm and they just dive in and that's it. And then that gets filtered to these just social media platforms that, that these people listen to uh, and to be gospel, uh, you know, and, and that's all they need is that little inch and they just exploit it and rip it apart. And, 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 and so to that purpose, so yeah. I was covering the Scott Peterson trial when my book about Michael Peterson came out 
So I had a couple of days in between and I flew back to Durham and I did a talk at Duke University with my book and, and yada, yada. And after the talk, they had a very prim and proper uh, reception for me with the little finger sandwiches, et cetera. And I had this beautiful room and I'm there signing books and a man comes up to me and I don't really see him because my head's down signing and he puts a talon on the table <laughs> that I'm signing the books on. So what is it? I look up what there's this big owl talon. Okay. Oh my God. I, and this is the first anybody's ever heard it. So now he's telling me, you know, an owl is what killed this woman. And I have proof of it. Look at I will show you when he starts flipping through the pages of my book. You see that the scalp with Kathleen Peterson and the and the marks on her scalp. He says, see, they match the talon. Exactly. So I'm thinking, okay, you're not now. I'm walking yeah. around the finger sandwiches, right? Signing spark is over. I'm supposed to be, you know, having a little uh, mingling time, and this guy's following me. I can't get rid of him with a talon. I thought, okay, now I go back on the Scott Peterson thing. I come back to Durham to do a book signing, and there he is at the book signing. Okay, I saw this is nuts. Okay, roll the tape forward. That nut. I wind up having to interview for my TV show many years later and have to sit there with a straight face while he's got <laughs> mounted stuffed owls around his office. <laughs> I swear to God. Oh. I swear to God. I am there having to keep the straightest face with this man because he is serious as a heart attack. And he's got the proof because now he's got microscopic owl feathers that were found in her hair. Here it is. He's showing me these microscopic images, you know, on a, with a whatever magnifying thing. I think of myself, okay, you know about down pillows that are filled with feathers? I sleep with down pillows. I have to like feathers. Uh, that comes out in your hair through the pillowcase all the time. Like, yeah. <laughs> what, what are you thinking here? Yeah. It's an owl. It was the owl. It was an owl. But well, we have owls in this area who live next door to the Petersons. I know it. And we saw it. And I know it. And he's managed to convince, including filmmakers, that this is a real possibility. They walk among us. The reaction. Oh, yeah. When you, when you watch the show and, and that part of, of the documentary and they interview people about the, the owl theory, the look on their face of utter like, yeah, this of course this is what happened. It's you just shake your head like, you know, what do we say, right? There's a there's a bridge down in Brooklyn for three bucks. You want it? It's amazing what people want to believe. And I actually went to David Rudolph's, one of his uh, talks he gave in New York area. I mean, he's getting, they were actually paying for tickets to see this, along with the guy who defended the making of a murderer case. Okay, those two teamed up. So they were this crime team out there to show whether the American justice system is corrupt and, 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 and inadequate and all of the rest, of it, just to destroy the American justice system as much as possible. Going to England and doing this, I got a call from a reporter in Durham years ago. Did you know they're in London, you know, trashing the American justice system? I thought, oh my God. So I went to see it. And they asked everybody to write a question, what have you like? Well, the questions for the guy from Making a Murderer were very short. And then the questions, Poor David Rudolph was the same question. What about the owl? Everybody wanted to know about this owl. That's what they were there for. And so what do you think Rudolph does? He actually has a whole presentation ready because he's obviously faced this everywhere else he's gone. And he presents this whole videotape of an owl and which owl it is and the kind of owl. And I, Actually, that never came into trial, obviously. When I asked the judge about it back when I had a sit with Larry Pollard, the owl man with the talon, when I was mortified and tried to keep a straight face, and I went to George, Judge Alander Hudson, I had interviewed him for that show, and I mentioned to him, and he looked at me like, you're kidding, right? Like, why are you even asking me about this? You know, no. He did come into trial. It wasn't in the original documentary, The Staircase, because even Xavier de la Strade, if I made it, knew that it seemed nuts. But then because of social pressure on social media, he had to address it. And he then added an episode with the owl. I, I don't understand why people want to think something like that is that's the culprit. 
can you can you even understand that? I'm trying to figure it out Arm, myself. Armchair honestly. detective. You know, and it just, it goes against. Yeah, right. Arm, I was just going to say, detectives. Everybody wants hear. to put their little junior detective hat on, and if it sounds good, or if I like the way the person is saying it, or if somebody I know who believes it likes it, like like for example, making of a murder. I watched that, and I didn't get to the very end of it because I was kind of disgusted. And so many people were saying, it is so obvious this guy is innocent. And I watched it. And after a couple episodes, I was like, this guy did it. <laughs> he absolutely did it. Yeah. And the yeah. only thing that they keep showing yeah, him talking, like sitting around with his mother going, I don't know, why are they blaming me? But I haven't seen any exculpatory evidence whatsoever. Everything about that case to me. Right. Well, the only thing that happened there, and, and similar to actually the Peterson case, the Michael Peterson case, in that there was a blood expert who muddied the waters and, and did uh, uh, un, un, the unethical, is what they called it, uh, experiments. I don't know that they were unethical. I actually interviewed that man too, Dwayne Burn. I think they were unethical. I think they were. He, he spent a lot of time because he was up against Dr. Henry Lee. And he spent a lot of time trying to figure out a styrofoam head coming downstairs. I saw the models that he created up the stairway. I mean, it was very complex what this man did. And don't get me wrong. He clearly was is overzealous. And there are other cases where he testified wrongly. And he, you know, he was ran out of town on a rail. Um, but in this trial, in the Michael Peterson trial, he didn't do anything wrong. He just, it was a technicality that allowed, you know, for the mistrial and then for allowed the you know, everybody say, oh, this is a corrupt justice system in America. But, you know, I think that when you take that premise and you want to look at America that way, if we're so corrupt over here in America, guys, what are you going to say about, oh, I don't know, oh, yeah. China or maybe Russia or maybe uh, let's, you know, let's go to Argentina, let's go to Venezuela. You know, right. we can pick out of a hat any number of countries around the world, uh, you know, including anything in Africa, whereas corruption is abounds. We're the ones? Look at Oscar Pistorius. I covered that case. I yeah. was in South Africa. I met with the journalist who covered and I and wrote the book on it. And I was ready to do something about it. But the unfortunately, the cameras in New York were like, we're not going to South Africa. Okay. But that case at the time, you know, he got off. Yeah. It was only because there was so much public pressure that they brought him back and he was found guilty. But there was overwhelming evidence that he did this. And there were phone calls and things that were left out of the original trial and the original case. Again, we're not talking about the justice like you'd get in America. We're talking about a different I think, I think we have the best right. system in the world based on my personal experiences of travel and study and things I've seen. It is an imperfect system because it involves human beings and we are imperfect. There will always be decisions. There will always be biased juries or jurors who can sway a jury. There will always be an ineffective prosecution because they didn't know how to communicate to the jury. Or there will always be uh, a variety of reasons why a case can go left or right. But by and large, overwhelmingly, you have the best shot at justice in this country that you do anywhere in the world. And I hate, I hate to see that tampered with. And I think there are times when there are judges who, who have acted grossly unprofessional. I, there have been many judicial decision, decisions that I have seen either in public cases or my own that I haven't agreed with, although I'm not an attorney. But I would just think certain relevant evidence is being left out uh, for a variety of reasons. And they have a lot of latitude. I mean, the judge is the judge. Uh, and you hope for the to be a pellet process, right? Well, um, I have to tell you though, guys, and I've been to a lot of trials. All right, I, it, big ones, not just small ones. A lot of small ones too. I've done them for thirty years. Um, but Bill Cosby, the retrial in Norristown, Pennsylvania. I went. Tom Mesereau was the attorney, and I covered Michael Jackson case. I wrote a book about it with Tom Mesereau as Jackson's attorney, and I have a relationship with him. I, I I find him to be a very credible defense attorney. Um, I knew in my heart when I heard those women start to testify about what happened when they were younger with Bill Cosby that he was going to go away. 
I felt absolutely certain, and it happened. There were other people speculating. No, it's not. Nah, 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 nah. He's going to walk. He's Bill Cosby, you know, star qualities, all this. But he had testified in his deposition that he gave the drugs to the girl, and he and they didn't. He had made that deal with the prosecutor that they can't oh, use that, and then they took. You know, it was the best. But afterward, but the fact is, justice was served with Bill Cosby. Uh, you know, another one on justice was served with Phil Spector. Remember, the first trial didn't happen. Come back. It was there for that, too. And these women are coming forward to testify about how he brandished the weapon and threatened them the minute they start to leak. And you start, the evidence piles up, and you realize, this jury, you, I watch juries. You know, that's my job. I'm seeing their reactions. I'm saying, they're going to convict him. This isn't going to be a slam dunk that these defense attorneys think. And sure enough, so Spectre got his... Bill Cosby got his, Ghislaine Maxwell got hers, and I had people betting me, oh, she's going to walk, they've got so much money, and Epstein and this, and it involves Bill Clinton, and da 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 No, I was in that courtroom. I watched those women who she lured for Jeffrey Epstein testify. And I actually had to make a bet with somebody, a friend of mine, I live in Florida as well, in Florida saying, that woman will never get found guilty. But the money she has, and the connections she has, et cetera, I said, I'll bet you $100. Well, he had offended me that $100. Oh, all right. Both of you. Who in their right mind is betting Aphrodite <laughs> Jones when it comes to something like Who the hell is putting that no. on the line? I mean, listen, we're going to get together when the, when the NFL playoffs start. Me and you will talk. We'll get together. <laughs> but when it comes to this, who's betting you? God. I don't know. You know, it's interesting, uh, you know, all the different perceptions that people have. And I'm, I look, I'm happy to tell a story and make it a whodunit, an interesting story, because that is what people want. And that is the genre that I'm in. So when I say I'm happy to do that. I mean, it not, doesn't necessarily serve the victims' families, but it does in the sense that no one's going to pay attention to the story at all if there isn't an element of mystery, surprise, you know. You can't have something that's a slam dunk. You can't have something that's all one-sided. No one's going to even look at it, pay attention to it. So you have to weave a narrative. You have to do this. As an author, as a television host, this is what I have to do. But my victims' families understand that because I have those conversations with them. So they know in the end, it's going to come out in the wash. They know that I'm playing a titillation with the audience to get the hook in. And that that's going to change, you know, it's going to yeah. look good until it doesn't. <laughs> a great storytellers do wow. that. And you are a great storyteller, but not a, a weaver of, uh, of fiction. You're a great storyteller of, of real stuff that shows real human experiences and then filters it through the court system and sees what happens to that truth. And sometimes that truth marches on its way to the jury and makes it there. But a lot of times it gets diverted and it gets changed and added to and the defense gets up there and throws all kinds of stuff up to make the jury think different things. And yeah, it's it's a very human thing. But um, you do an amazing job telling, you know, I've seen so many of your shows uh, and you can find them still on TV. Uh, you have you're not currently making uh, regular episodes of your show. I know that, right? No, but my show is with True Crime with Everybody Jones. It's on ID for six seasons. I did 63 episodes of that. and. Um, it is on Hulu, it's on Amazon Prime, it's on, you know, all these streaming services. If any, anybody has a streaming service, you, you can easily find it. Um, I particularly like the episode of Darren J. Simpson. And uh, because there's tape footage of him in there that no one's ever seen before. Uh, he that's, that's something special, that one, you know, OJ. And of course, talk about defense attorneys throwing stuff against the wall. That glove that didn't fit, that glove was... How many years old by the time the trial happened, or whatever the a lead time between the murder and the trials was a year or two years? I don't remember exactly, but those things shrivel up. It was covered in blood. Covered in blood, sitting in a box, and OJ did wrapped this with in his plastic. Hand. You can see him right. with his hand spread as far as he can do it, and he's trying to put. He said, "Done fit, done fit." I mean, come on, that whole thing was yeah, I, yeah. It was contrived. And on top of which, he was told, don't take your, uh, any of your aspirin or, or Advil for your arthritis. Make sure your joints on your finger. And I know that from an insider who, who confessed it to me. Wow. Yeah, make sure that your hand is as swollen as possible. 
So if the glove don't fit, you must have quit. Apparently, that way. Yeah. Well, well with the jury. My, yeah. Hey, Dan, I, I, I played a detective on TV and stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. But did we just set we up did. like another show with with AJ? I think we did. Yeah, no, I, I think we just. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Note let me write that. Th- let me AJ, write that. Down. OJ. 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 Yeah. AJ. <laughs> <laughs> o- OJ show, which you know what's funny though, we haven't done. We haven't done that. You Barry, done tell us to touch no. on it briefly. No, but we have not done a show on that, and it is yep. a fascinating case. And your perspective will be invaluable. Our audience will love it, and I will love to hear your experiences covering that trial and oh, knowing God, yeah. Mark Furman and, and people from the LAPD and the community as well as you do. Love, love to have you back. Well, and I actually involved in the Vegas end of things with the Goldmans. So I have that perspective much more so, but of course I have the overall sense of it because I did cover it. Uh, yeah. You know, you can never get tired of two things. Yeah. OJ Simpson <laughs> and Casey Anthony. You're and, right. You know, You're right. They, they're the two cases on the top of the wedding cake. <laughs> you know, the other OJ, Casey, which one? You know, they both got away with murder. You're right. And they both were the most sensationalized cases. In fact, when I was in South Africa, it was to launch the ID channel there. And uh, people were asking me not about the ID channel, not about anything my show, this, yeah, that, yeah. the Casey Anthony trial just happened. So Warren White, even though it doesn't have, he didn't have, she didn't have the sensationalism of being an O.J. Simpson, worldwide, people were astonished at the details and then even more astonished that she actually walked. Walked. Yep. That's an unbelievable oh. case. It really is. Well, we're just going to have to get uh, your regular slot with us because we want to hear all these stories and stuff. Uh, you, you have so much experience and um, we can't begin to thank you enough for today's discussion. And we hope it's just the first of many. And we know that we. Well, thank you. I'd be, I'd be and my we pleasure know that we'll to meet come you in person at an event. Oh, that's happening. About, and we're looking forward to that. But Yeah. Right, but Crime Con. So we're all going to do oh, yeah. Crime Con in Nashville this year. I'm very looking forward to it. I'm actually going to be there to talk about A Perfect Husband, Michael Peterson, The Staircase. And I am bringing with me, hopefully, the lead detective. He's tired of all this 20 years of talking about it. But I am friends with him, and I think I can convince him. But also, I am bringing with me somebody he's never seen before, which is a witness oh, to really? the scene in Germany. Wow. Always- yes. So I have an eyewitness that will be presenting with me. And I believe Art Holland will come through. And maybe not, but I hope he does. If he doesn't, it's more time for me because I got this story <laughs> hands. To, no hold barred on this story. But I, yeah, I mean, Art was the lead detective on this thing. And he's the, the, he and the, and the witness from Germany are fuming. Yesterday, Vanity Fair came out with the top shows to watch on Netflix. What do you think they were? One of them was the staircase. staircase. That's yesterday, wow. 2024. It still keeps giving. Yeah. The gift that it, keeps on giving. Right. So tell us about what you have going Amazing. on. You, have, love- uh, you mentioned your books. Um, please let your audience know what, what can they access that you've been working on and tell us what you're up to. Sure. So number one, as I mentioned before, my book, Levi's Eyes, A Son's Deadly Secret, and a father's cruel betrayal is is out there. Um, it is selling very well around the world, and it's Amazon. Just get on there. It's ebook. It's hardcover. It's softcover. I'm in the process now of beginning to put audiobooks, putting all my voice to the audio, and narrating my books. So the first will be Levi's Eyes. Um, I just created the sound list here in my office, and getting ready to do uh, that. Um, and I have eight more books besides Levi's Eyes to narrate. So that's probably taking a little time. Uh, then there's the movie based on my book that is in percolation. We'll see. You know, I have had three of my books become movies. So that's another another sort of issue that I, I have to actually make that happen or try to make it happen. It's it's a, a pulling a hat, rabbit out of a hat, really, with Hollywood. We'll see. And then uh, at the same time, I mean, I, I'm percolating a new TV idea or streaming idea can't actually say what it is but it's it's there in the background and i when i get through with levi's eyes the audio then i'll turn to it before i start doing all the other books because that obviously is, is more pressing 
for me. Um, and of course, I don't know, I might do a podcast if the TV thing doesn't work out. I don't know. You know, it's there's so many podcasts and so little time. So I'm not so sure. As I've yeah, said yeah. before, so many murders, <laughs> so little time. And and you're gonna so, do all and you're gonna do all that in your spare time because you just have all the time in the world to do twenty seven different and, projects. And that's why we so appreciate your time today. <laughs> we God. know how busy you are. And this has been an honor and, and a privilege for us and just a joy to talk to you. But thank you. And we hope everybody uh, buys your books. I know I have and I will continue to because I, I can't wait to read um, about Mr. Peterson. I'll start out with him. Then Levi's eyes, I'll go to that. But uh, we, Tom and I, just so you know, are more than willing and will make ourselves available to two things. One, have you on any time to update the audience on what you're doing and talk about other great cases that you've covered and that you have unique insight on. And secondly, we are willing to play the roles of detectives in any of your movies. Just saying. <laughs> you got it. You got yeah, it, guys. Happy to do I that. love it. Absolutely. And we can't wait for Crime Con. Yeah. You know, we yeah. got our, we got our feet really wet. Excited. We got our feet wet last year. We're kind of seeing where we fit with all that. And now we can't wait for next year. Uh, well, for you know, year. I was all there right. as a speaker for the inaugural Crime Con, which is in uh, in uh, Indianapolis in 2017. So here we are. You know, it's seven years later, and boom. So I'm really That's looking forward to it as That's well. That's a blast. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to echo Danny and just thank you so, so much for your time, for your insight, for your stories, and the work you do. You know, it's it's one thing to to have a passion, but then to do it at such a high level is is something else. You know, and you can tell. No, no. Thank you, Tom. And you know what? You You can. The best part about it, though, AJ, is you watch you, and you're you're prideful in what you do. It's not just yeah, I wrote a book. Yeah, I, I, you know, it became a movie. You can see it in your face and in you know your voice how prideful you are in that, and that makes it even better. Uh, that makes it not in an ego way. Yo, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, look, this is my life's work. I don't have. I have kids. I don't have kids. Okay. I don't, I, you know, I got married very late, late life. My life, my babies are my books. That is my life. Working with law enforcement, doing what I do has become my life. And so, and you asked me in the beginning of the show, and I will wrap with this. You said, why did you get into this? Yes, I fell into it with the FBI killer, not my first book. But there's something else. I lost my parents when I was young. They died of heart attacks. They didn't die of a crime. But it doesn't matter when you're 17 and then by 21, you have no parents. Um, the, the feeling is uh, I, I've been abandoned. I'm an orphan. You know, what, what's going to happen? And that feeling of loss, utter loss that I carry with me to this day in my whole life is what allows me to um, not just sympathize, but empathize with victims because it doesn't matter Really, it, of course, it matters if somebody's murdered. It's much more horrific. But at the end of the day, you lost your person. You know, you lost your loved one, and they're not coming back. Even when you get justice, it it it, it doesn't serve you because you want your loved one back. And so I had that simpatico, if you will, and I think that translates into my career. What an Absolutely. ending! Well, thank what you, ending. thank you, thank you, thank so, you, and thank uh, you again. <laughs> We Thank will you. talk soon, I'm sure. And um, Tom, why don't you do what you do so well, which is take us out. Well, we want to, again, thank AJ for her time and everything this show. And it was what we thought, what we wanted, what we hoped for with a premiere show of season two. Uh, so thank you. And like we always do, say a prayer for all the law enforcement officers out there, all the military vets out there. Because they do a thankless job and they do it for a bunch of strangers. And they go out there and do the job day in and day out and don't ask for anything in return. And the best thing that you could do for them is give them a wave on the street, pat them on the back in the store, and just make their day by saying thank you. Uh, It means the world to them. Trust me, because Dan and I have experienced it. And a thank you from someone is the best in the world. So make sure you do that. Keep them all in your prayers and their families, because we've said the, the hardest thing in the world is cops and military families. So keep them all in your prayers. So for our premiere show of season two, 
Aphrodite Jones, thank you so much. My partner, Dan Murphy. This is Tom Smith. Everyone stay safe and make sure you go to thegoldshieldshow.com. Get on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Gold Shields. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get all the notifications. We're also on Rumble and every conceivable audio channel out there. Your favorites, we're, we're there. Hit the follow button. Don't miss an episode. Thank you all for, for joining us today, and we will see you all soon.